I'm a technical director. I've been a technical director for sports, live sports for 15 years. Um, I'm based in Madison, Wisconsin, although it seems location doesn't matter all that much these days. You don't need 15 cameras. You only need a few cameras and you have a set or a room like this. Per hour, I would say a good estimate is, I'd say about about 10 to 20 dollars an hour is actually the true cost of it. You probably already know everything you need to know. Can you plug in your, you know, plug in your computer via a wired connection to your router? A lot of these jobs don't show up on job boards. The job boards are for full full-time positions. So, Michael, for those who are not familiar with you, tell us a little bit about what you do, where are you based, and what's your expertise in our industry? Um, well, first, I'm a, uh, I'm a technical director. I've been a technical director for sports, live sports, for 15 years. Um, I'm based in Madison, Wisconsin, although it seems location doesn't matter all that much these days. Um, So I do a lot of uh, a lot of big shows for for the sports network, CBS, Fox, TNT, um, ESPN. If it's got three or four letters, I've probably worked for them at some point over the last uh, 15 years. And um, since 2019, you know, since uh, since the pandemic, uh, we got it into cloud production mostly by necessity. And it turns out that those techniques and doing things with software rather than hardware or traditional um, traditional facilities works in uh, in a lot of cases so I took that idea ran with it and uh, now I uh, teach people and uh, production companies how to do this um, using uh, software and cloud resources like AWS How would you define cloud production for those that don't understand completely the concept and don't have a, a real knowledge of what it is? When people say cloud production, there's kind of two different methods or two different uh, things that come up. Some people say cloud production, and they're just meaning that the control room, a physical control room, is in a different physical location from where the cameras are. Um, That could be called, it can be called cloud, it could be called Remy, it could be called home run production. There's a lot of names for it, um, but sometimes that style of production gets lumped into cloud. Um, that works really well for larger scale events. Uh, the stuff I focus on is um, truly all in the cloud. There's no physical control room anywhere. Um, there is hardware, there's physical hardware, obviously you still need cameras like this, mm -hmm. um, but it's more focusing on using the tools that everybody has already, cameras, webcams, you know, a $500 camera looks really good these days. And if you're doing this type of content, that's all you need. Um, so using those tools to bring a production together um, without using any, any, without any physical control room, uh, it, to do it. Everybody can work from home using a decent internet connection and you can have a, a director, you can have a graphics operator, you can have a producer all collaborating together with uh, no upfront hardware investment. You can spin up these resources in AWS or whatever cloud provider you have and do a lot of the same things depending on the content. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good explanation. Uh, Going back to your explanation, the other day you posted something in, on LinkedIn saying, I directed a 12-camera NHL game from my house, from your yes. home. Uh, is it where you are right now? Uh, yeah, I did it from this office. Um, we uh, That was a, a proof of concept for the NHL. They are really leading the way in in looking at some of these techniques and how they can use them to... Um, enhance their current product. Like they don't, there's always going to be a truck on site. That's not going to yeah. go away because you need the equipment there. You need the cameras there. There has to be a physical presence and that's, that's going to stay the way it is. But what they're looking to do is create alternative feeds, additional broadcasts, um, 
special feeds for social without adding a whole uh, um, without adding a lot of extra cost or infrastructure. And so we took the 12 cameras that were on site. This was done in Seattle back in um, mm -hmm. in the spring, fed them into the cloud. The, the NHL is doing that already with all of their league infrastructure and replay. Um, so it wasn't that big of a leap. We just did it in a little bit different way. Um, fed that into the cloud, used uh, VizVector Plus, which is now called TriCaster Vector, to uh, switch the show. It's a cloud software-based switcher. It's got eight MEs. It's got a lot of inputs. It's got 16 output or eight outputs, I think. It can do a lot. And um, yeah, I sat here, looked at a multi-viewer. I had two replay operators, one in Vancouver, one in um, Toronto handling the replays for me. And uh, we put together a little demo. We had a graphics operator in Seattle, put together a demo show and kind of shadow cut the main broadcast. Um, it wasn't a full complete show. It was, uh, th there was no A1, for instance, we just took the main broadcast feed, but it was kind of just a demonstration of, hey, this could be done. And I'm sitting here in my office looking at a multi-viewer just like I was in a truck and there was virtually no latency. You know, when I said take one and I hit the button, I saw it switch instantly. When I told the replay operator to roll red, I see it roll instantly. So there was none of the latency like we have with the traditional Remy models right now that uh, you might be a second behind sitting yeah. in a control room across the country. Uh, this wasn't like that. So it was really impressive to um, to sit down and actually and actually do that. The other day also, when we were uh, talking, exchanging text messages about it, you said the opportunity is not only in sports and probably the opportunity for cloud production. It's bigger outside of sports in all the events that happen for conferences and all the, I mean, uh, sales channels. I have seen many sales channels doing their yes. remote production or cloud production. Uh, what do you mean by that when you when you sent me that, that text? Outside of sports? Um... Yeah, we've been, uh, I've been supporting um, several clients that do exactly this. Uh, one of the big ones right now is live stream shopping. Mm -hmm. um, those videos are, you know, they're, they're professional looking, but they've got to be very, they've got to be done very quickly, very fast, very accurately. And um, we've been supporting uh, Amazon Live, their live stream shopping channel platform, um, doing some of the higher tier stuff for them um, and switching those feeds from home. A lot of it's very simple. It's one or two cameras. Um, sometimes it's, sometimes it's more, there's a, you know, talent remote. Usually they could be in their house. They could be somewhere uh, on site. Um, and we insert the graphics. We hand, we handle all the technical aspects of the operation. So their team can handle the content. And we've been doing that since 2019 for them. So it's very possible to, uh, to use it for that kind of format, you know, talking head style um, productions where you don't need 15 cameras. You only need a few cameras and you have a set or a room like this. Um, one of the other segments that uh, can benefit from this is um, any, any podcast studio style show. If you need to have multi-camera and you need to do a little bit more production, um, and have somebody help you because it's, let's be honest, it's really hard to host your own show and cut it live and insert graphics and do all that stuff. Yeah. Um, but if you want to scale up production and do it fast and efficiently, live to tape is the way to do it. You know, the entertainment industry has been doing that, doing it that way for many, many years. And there's a reason why, um, because you save so much money on the back end if yeah. you just, have somebody helping you with the uh, with the tech and cutting your show as if it were live. Now you don't have to uh, spend hours and hours editing. You might only have to spend a little bit of time fixing a couple of mistakes, if if anything at all. So there's a huge opportunity for medium sized, even small media companies to scale their production uh, capabilities um, by using this kind of workflow. Okay, let's say that I decided to start getting into cloud production and I want to start within the next uh, two months or the next month, what are the steps that I would need to take, Michael, to, to do this? If you wanted to do it, um, first of all, figure out what, you know, figure out what your needs are. How many people, how many people are you going to have? 
um, when it's a single person just talking to the camera and you're streaming out to YouTube or Twitch or whatever, whatever your distribution method is, all of that stuff I, did, I just said doesn't really apply. You can do that with, with, you know, your software of choice on your computer. OBS is a good one to start with mm -hmm. because you're not sending your, you don't need anybody else to be able to hear you. It just needs to go out to, to your viewers. As soon as you add multiple people in multiple locations, things get extremely complicated very quickly. Now you're dealing, dealing with latency. You're dealing with audio. Um, uh, mix minus audio is a big one that uh, is tough for some people to understand. So you, you need to find a system that can do all that for you. Um, there's a few software switchers out there. Um, so identify a software, a piece of software that has all these capabilities that can bring in remote guests that has the number of inputs you need. And if you're going to do any graphics, um, make sure it can handle that for you and figure out if it supports the streaming destinations you need. Um, so that's kind of like level one. There's, there's a lot of limitations that come with that. Um, it, those systems can be very, they're very inexpensive. They're very easy to use, but with that ease of use comes with lack of flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to do something a little more in depth and you need that, you need more flexibility. Um, then you need to look at something like uh, vMix or TriCaster or Vector. Um, those are kind of the top software switchers that are out there. They're very good at what they do, but they do have a much steeper learning curve. So the steps I would take if you're looking to go to that next level of content production, um, start with one of those. Start with one of those switchers as your core of everything you do um, and build it out. You could do it in your system. Uh, if you have a decent computer system at home, install it there. If you don't and you don't want that heavy upfront investment, which is kind of the whole <laughs> the value of the cloud, which is that's how I started. I didn't need to spend thousands and thousands of dollars building a studio. Um, first step you take is go get a go get an account at AWS and learn how to use it. That's something I can I can help with. I've done this uh, a few times for smaller productions. They said, "Well, we don't have the budget for technicians. We just need to be able to do this. Our producers in Florida, our host is in California." Perfect. I can tell you exactly how to do this. Um, go to AWS. I set them up with a virtual machine there with uh, vMix, remote access to it from anywhere. And now they've got a TV studio in a box, basically. And they only pay for it hourly um, based on their usage. And when, they pay, when, when you said they pay that, uh, what's an estimate, a good estimate? Because I know it can vary depending on your location and everything, but what's mm -hmm. a good estimate for, for let's say, we want to start doing some interview show uh, to people. What's a good estimate that we are going to pay uh, per hour? Per hour, I would say a good estimate is, <laughs> I would say about, about $10 to $20 an hour is actually the true cost of it. There's you know, you can go on, on the AWS's website and look at the pricing calculators, yeah. but there's a lot of pieces that the machine itself, it'll say, okay, this, this size machine with a, with a good graphics processor, with a good GPU is $3 and 50 cents an hour. But that's not the only thing that, that is in there. You have to talk, look at bandwidth, um, the storage for the machine, the hard drive, whatever, you know, that, that takes up, uh, additional cost, um, bandwidth outgoing bandwidth. Um, but yeah, you can get that cost way down and um, about 10 to 10 to $20 an hour in a traditional facility. It can't even touch that kind of pricing. No, no there's no, there's no way. There's no right. way. There's no way. And you can get also, I mean, not only a traditional facility, but you have to take into account if you have the producer in Florida then you have to fly talent or fly one of them to each other's location, you add travel, you add many mm -hmm. other other layers. Um, you were mentioning vMix or TriCaster uh, earlier. And I remember that five, six years ago, saying that I was a vMix operator was like, you are amateur, you you are not a pro, you have no, uh, you're not with the, with the traditional broadcasting industry. But nowadays, right. Having that knowledge to operate one of these software tools or others, it's a plus. 
And when you have it, when you have a professional with this knowledge, it's it's an enhancement for the possibilities that you can you can uh, do with your production. What are your thoughts on this, and how have you seen the evolution? The old the old saying is true. It's not about the tools; it's how you use them. Um, yeah, VMix was kind of a. It was used a lot in corporate events. It was used a lot in you know in. Uh, 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 church streaming and worship services that it's been always been very popular in that segment. But, um, it was, I think for a very long time, it was kind of regarded as a prosumer product. And then once everything, once the technology grew and the pandemic forced us to look at things differently, we, we saw these tools in a different way and said, wait, this, this is useful. This, this accomplishes 80% of what I need to do. Um, you don't need this massive piece of hardware to do the simple things. Let's be honest. Most people, if they have a giant switcher, they don't use 80% of the capabilities of it anyway. Companies like uh, like Fox Sports were doing their studio shows with vMix. I knew the director, one of the directors for their show, he was he was doing a um, one of their talk shows, one of their you know sports talk shows from his garage using vMix because they couldn't go into the studio. So the tools have really come a long way. And I think the, the mindset around them has changed. Like, wait, I can, I can make a serious living helping companies and using my, using my expertise of this tool um, to produce professional looking content. And, and you can produce very professional looking content with, with, with vMix or Vector or TriCaster. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's certainly changed a lot in the last five years. I think we've seen a massive jump in uh, technology, a massive acceleration in technology over the last five years. What non-traditional knowledge I need to acquire if I want to start and be ready to, to work in, in cloud productions? You do need a little bit of a base. You don't need a very deep knowledge of networking if all you're doing is needing to connect your computer system at home to someone else's resources. Um, you probably already know everything you need to know. Can you plug in your, you know, plug in your computer via a wired connection to your router? You probably can. Can you troubleshoot your internet connection when it goes down? Yes, you probably can. Um, so do you, can you connect to a VPN? You've probably done that before in some fashion. Those are all the skills that you need. So you, it's not a really deep knowledge. You just need basic troubleshooting skills. What happens if my computer can't connect to the internet? Well, now that's on you to figure out why in your house because mm -hmm. we can't send an engineer there. Um, so I'd say basic troubleshooting skills, um, number one. But it's stuff that anybody who's been using technology or computers um, probably already has that knowledge. Um, number two is... Uh, learn the tools. That's a uh, fairly easy, I'd say to learn a piece of software. That's the easy part. Learning the changes in the workflow and how a live production works whenever with everybody in a different spot. That's the hardest part. Um, it's a little different because you don't have the same, if you're in a truck and everybody's in the same room, communication's a lot easier because you can, there's a lot of nonverbal communication that happens. There's a lot of things that are happening. Um, all at once and you can kind of pay attention to it. So the biggest part about being in different places is communication, communication, communication. It becomes critical to communicate with your other crew members, you know, over, over the intercom, over whatever, whatever method you're using to, uh, to coordinate. So you got to get really good at that. Um, you can't just sit around and wait. If something's wrong with, if, if something is wrong and you need to address it, you can't just sit around and wait. You got to be very proactive. So it's a little bit of a different mindset. Nobody's going to jump in and save you. You've got to make sure you're communicating what's happening with everybody. Um, so that's that's one skill, just verbal communication. Where, where can I find a job in, in cloud production? Is it through the same network? Uh, have or do you think that it's something that I should go and look online, or should I start looking for specific companies that are doing these and knock on their doors and have to, I mean, do the same that I do in traditional production, but identifying the companies that are doing more cloud? 
Um, I think a lot of the traditional channels still apply. Like if you're if you're looking for a, a you know a job in sports specifically, I'd say on that side of things, there's less cloud right now. Um, where to look for a job? Esports is a big one. There's that they have embraced remote production, and that's kind of where a lot of these techniques grew from. Um, they have graphics operators, they have replay operators, they have directors all sitting from home. Um, some of the smaller, lower, uh, smaller sports shows are doing this now. I know of a few um, packagers like uh, I think BM Broadcast Management Group (BMG) is doing. Their, their directors are at home for some of the, you know, four four camera uh, basketball games. Some of those tier two sports to save on travel costs, but it's completely feasible to do it that way. Um, so you could start with those those types of companies that are doing these productions um, and go from there. In the corporate space, there's a lot of event companies that are now li- that now offer live streaming services. So there's a lot of opportunity there to do certain positions from home um, for virtual events or town halls or meetings or presentations. Um, a lot of that stuff can be accomplished remotely as well. The biggest, the biggest way to get a job or the best way to get a job in this industry as a whole is just to put yourself out there. A lot of these jobs don't show up on job boards. The job boards are for full, full-time positions, but the production gigs typically don't show up. You got to get out there. You got to talk to people. You got to figure out what they need and you have to be there when they need you. Um, I know it's, I make it, it I'm not trying to make it sound easy because it certainly isn't, but um, you just have to be there when they need you. You got to be in the right place at the right time. It's a little bit of luck, but it's also a little bit of expanding your, um, what I've seen other people say online is expanding your luck surface area. Luck isn't always luck. If you're out there talking to everybody about what you do, your luck becomes less luck and more a numbers game. The more people you tell what you do, the more people that you tell what you want to do, what skills you have the more likely you are to get somebody to say, hey, I need that. I just had so-and-so. Um, I just had this, you know, if they've got regular crew they use all the time, well, they're not available. I really need somebody. Can you do it? And that's going to go a long way. Yeah. Michael, I've seen one of the things that I have seen in your work, it's that you are willing to help people and willing to teach others what you have learned and based on your experience, where can people find you first? And what are the ways that you can help them right now? Um, yeah. Right now, the, the best way to find me is um, on LinkedIn. I respond to a lot, a lot of comments. Um, send me a message there. Just search for me, Michael Lang, on LinkedIn. Um, I respond to, to most of my messages. Um, I obviously, I can't respond to everything. But uh, tell me a little bit about who you are, what you do. And um, I'll see how I can help you out. Um, I also have a, a YouTube channel. It's called Live Streaming with AWS. You could search for that or search for my name, Michael Lang. You'll probably see some of my tutorials. So that's that's another way I can help you. I've got a lot of information on there right now about live streaming. I plan to add more tips and tools and techniques on on these skills. So that's two ways you can contact me. And if you are a content producer already and looking to set up a a remote studio, you've got people in all kinds of different places and you want to put something together. um, Again, just hit me up on LinkedIn and and I'll see how I can help. That's great because uh, as we have been discussing, not many people is doing the, the, the job or the work of spreading the message and spread the knowledge. Uh, mm-hmm. Sometimes we are like, mm, no, if, if I share my, what I know with others, maybe those are going to take my spot, but in your case, I have seen that you are really upfront and you are you are not shy about sharing what you do, not only in this part of your of your uh, career, but also on the on the traditional side. Because I have seen you the other day, I saw a post, a very good post uh, about macros and about um, traditional switcher configuration, and th- that's mm-hmm. great, and that's that's very good from my point of view of what you're doing right now. Yeah, I like sharing those techniques. Um, there's a lot of a lot of people out there that are really interested in those deep dives because it's something for some people it's 
it's a new perspective for some people. It's a new concept entirely. And um, yeah, that tends to get a lot of, a lot of people talking and, and that's the whole point is get people talking about this. The way I do it is not the only way to do it. You know, the old joke is ask 10 TDs and you'll get 10 different answers. That's certainly true. Um, and people aren't afraid to share their opinions, but that's what I like to see. We, there's been some techniques that I've adopted because of people's comments, mm -hmm. because of people's engagement to those, those, um, those types of posts and that type of content. And that's kind of, that's kind of, uh, what posting that information is for. Um, if somebody gets a good idea about how to improve their setup, great. That's exactly, exactly why I put that information out there. Three things before, before we finish. Number one, um, how much availability of free knowledge is there around what you are doing right now? Let's say, should I, I know there is because I have found a lot, let's say mm -hmm. um, AWS makes a, a good work in providing uh, tools for those to learn, but how much availability is there? And where are those places that I can go to start like getting more information about it? Yeah, there's, <laughs> the knowledge is out there and most of it is free. Um, let's just put it that way. You can get all the information you want on vMix for free yeah. on YouTube. Just search. You'll find a tutorial on it. Um, AWS, you can, AWS has their website, AWS Skills Builder. If you want to learn how to go set up a, a virtual network, set up an account, get a virtual machine running, they have got great tutorials there as well. Um, I think it's awsskillsbuilder.com. Um, go there, just, just learn. Uh, the knowledge is, is out there. If you want to learn more about production and working in a truck, that kind of thing, um, follow people like you and I. Pe find people out there who are talking about this stuff and ask them questions. That knowledge is a little bit harder to come by, uh, but it can be, it can be found. Um, the biggest way to learn, the biggest way to learn those skills is talk to somebody who does it. That's usually how that's how you grow your craft. That's how you get better at what you do. Find somebody that is doing what you want to do and talk to them. Okay. If I if you have to give me an answer right now, cloud remote or in the truck? What's your preference? What's my preference? Ooh, right that, now? <laughs> that's a tough question. Um there's things I like about both. Let's just put it that way. Um I'd say uh, right now I like, I like cloud a lot because it gives me more flexibility. Um, I like talking about it and I like the challenge of the new workflows. Um, that being said, I do think I would miss a production truck if I didn't at least step foot in one, you know, once every couple of weeks. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> that's fair. I, yeah, I have a, I, I do a mix of both right now, probably 50, 50. Um, but, it's, it's been great because like I said, it gives you a lot more flexibility, a lot more opportunities in an industry that's kind of consolidating. The sports industry mm -hmm. is, there's more jobs than ever, but they seem to be, they seem to be consolidating around these studios. So if you're not in one of those locations, what do you do? Um, well, cloud is, cloud is one of the answers and okay. it's easier for certain crafts than others. Like as a technical director, that's going to be, there's going to be the fewest jobs available in the cloud for that position. But if you're a graphics operator, if you're a replay operator, if you're a bug operator, if you're a, even if you're a, uh, uh, an assistant producer, that kind of, those kind of positions, those are being remoted consistently and they're everywhere. So. Oh, but the good thing is, you don't have to choose. You can have the best of both worlds, and that's that's great. Exactly, uh, Michael. Finally, one one uh, discussion that I always have with my friends in the in Europe in the UK. Mm -hmm. How do you like to be called? Better, vision mixer, technical director. Oh, that that, that question can start wars. <laughs> <laughs> um, technical director just the term has never made sense to me. I understand why now for a very long time, because mm -hmm. the, the technical director that when switchers were very simple, the person operating the switcher was the, 
basically the manager of the crew, what we would call a, a technical producer now was the, also that role because they didn't have much to set up. They sat down, they patched their sources. They, that was about it. Um, but now since that's become very, the, the switchers have become far more complicated and there's a lot more to do. Vision mixer makes a lot more sense to me. Um, but good luck convincing anybody in the, uh, on this side of the, uh, the Atlantic to yeah, it's true. change their, it's, change their terms. It's totally true. I'm working on a, on a, on a broadcasting dictionary so people can understand how the, their positions are called whenever they go to a different country, because it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's different. And that mm -hmm. difference on the name makes a difference on how you're performing, how you're doing things and how you're going to operate. Um, what, what, amazes, what amazes me is the difference in how the job is performed in Europe yeah. versus the North America. What, what um, do you see as the first uh, difference, as the main differences? Well, to me, having a director cut their own cameras is completely, is a completely strange concept. Um, and, ha you know, as the vision mixer, if, if I were doing football in Europe, the vision mixer just sits down, builds the, builds the show, programs the effects, and is pretty much just running the replays and the director's doing the rest. It's more of a support role. So that, that is such a strange departure. Um, but at the same time, I can, I can see why the positions in, in North America and Europe developed the way they did. I, I should say Europe and the rest of the world. I yeah. think they're, you know, the rest of the world pretty much uses the same format. The, we, <laughs> We have a lot more commercial breaks in our content. So the shows are much more complicated. And I think that has a lot to do with it. You know, football, soccer, it's just not a lot of breaks in the action. American football seems like it was designed to sell ads. And it was. Um, so there's just a lot more. There's a lot more to do to do that style of show. So I think that has a, that has a lot to do with why the positions developed in the way that they did. Yeah, I have seen, I have worked with, with two different, with the two different uh, aspects of the, of the position, even in Europe with people that are cutting show while the director cuts some cameras, some others are like cutting the show while the director is calling the cameras, mm -hmm. but it's, it, it changes a lot. And also it changes on the technical knowledge or that each side has but i mean in the end the, the work is done the job is yeah. done and that's the most important exactly it's you know if you get a show on the air and it looks good and the viewers like it yeah i don't it the, how you get it how you accomplish that doesn't really matter you know as long as as long as everybody's got a role and it works yep go for it so so Michael, thank you very much. We are going to leave all your, the information uh, to your LinkedIn page, to your YouTube channel in the description of this video. And I'm sure that for those who are thinking and reaching out to Michael, go and do it. He's, uh, if he's not cutting a, a, an NFL or a college football game or a basketball game, any, any of the productions he does, he's going to reply very, very quickly. If not, give him a couple of, of hours. And as soon as he finishes, he's going to, he's going to reply to you. Thank you very much for joining. You are my first guest in this uh, in this broadcast thing uh, series that we're doing, and I appreciate you. And I'm, I hope Thanks. to keep in in touch with you, learning from you, and helping spreading the word about what we're doing in this industry. All right, thanks for having me, Oscar. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,